So tonight we learn about the jhanas. Jhanas are levels of understanding, levels of awareness. It's like a tadpole becoming a frog and ultimately learning what the earth is like. So those who have not experienced jhanas are still tadpoles. And I will just do a reading and uh, we can discuss after that. So this is from Kaya Gata Satisutta, Majjhima Nikaya 119. And I only read the section on the jhanas uh, and we will see from there. Again because quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. He makes the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion drench, steep, fill and pervade this body so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Just as a skilled bathman or a bathman's apprentice heaps bath powder in a metal basin and sprinkling it gradually with water, kneads it till the moisture wets his bowl of bath powder soaks it and pervades it inside and out, yet the ball itself does not ooze. So too, a bhikkhu makes the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, drench, steep, fill and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. As he abides thus, he develops mindfulness of the body. This is still with the body that you are dealing with. Again because with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of concentration. He makes the rapture and pleasure born of concentration drench, steep, fill and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of concentration. Just as though there were a lake whose waters welled up from below and it had no inflow from east, west, north or south and would not be replenished from time to time by showers of rain. Then the cool fount of water welling up in the lake would make the cool water drench, steep, fill and pervade the lake so that there would be no part of the whole lake unpervaded by cool water. So too, a bhikkhu makes the rapture and pleasure born of concentration, drench, steep, fill and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of concentration. This is a third jhana. Again because with the fading away as well of rapture, a bhikkhu abides in equanimity and mindful and uh, fully aware, 
still feeling pleasure with the body. He enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. He makes a pleasure divested of rapture, drench, steep, fill and pervade this body so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the pleasure divested of rapture. Just as in a pond of blue or white or red lotuses, some lotuses that are born and grow in the water thrive immersed in the water without rising out of it. And cool water drenches, steeps, fills, and pervades them to their tips and their roots, so that there is no part of all those lotuses unpervaded by cool water. So too, a bhikkhu makes the pleasure divested of rapture, drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body. So there is so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the pleasure divested of rapture. And the fourth jhana. Again because with the abandoning of pleasure and pain and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. He sits pervading this body with a pure bright mind, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the pure bright mind. Just as though a man were sitting covered from head down with a white cloth, so that there would be no part of his whole body not covered by the white cloth, so too a bhikkhu sits pervading this body with a pure bright mind so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the pure bright mind as he abides thus diligent ardent and resolute his memories and intentions based on the household life are abandoned with their abandoning his mind becomes steadied internally quieted brought to singleness and concentrated. That is about the four jhanas. <coughs> and I switch to uh, another sutta. This is Anupada Sutta, uh, Majjhima Nikaya 111. This is like progression, one by one as they occurred. So please listen carefully. And it has little more details that I like to share. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatha Pindika's Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, Venerable Sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this, Bhikkhus, Sariputta is wise, Sariputta has great wisdom, Sariputta has wide wisdom. Sariputta has joyous wisdom. Sariputta has quick wisdom. Sariputta has keen wisdom. Sariputta has penetrative wisdom. During half a month, because Sariputta gained insight into states one by one as they occurred. Now, Sariputta's insight into states one by one as they occurred was this. Here, because quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. And the states in the first jhana, the applied thought, the sustained thought, the rapture, the pleasure, and the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind, the zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, 
equanimity and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known th they disappeared, he understood thus. So indeed these states not having been come into being, having been they vanish. Regarding those states he abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated, with the mind rid of barriers. He understood there is an escape beyond, and with the cultivation of that attainment he confirmed that there is. Again because, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, Sariputta entered and abided in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of concentration. And the states in the second jhana, the self-confidence, the rapture, the pleasure, and the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, volition and mind, the seal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood thus and with the cultivation of that attainment he confirmed that there is. So there is a higher escape. Again because with the fading away as well of rapture, Sariputta abided in equanimity and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body. He entered upon and abided in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. And the states in the third jhana, the equanimity, the pleasure, the mindfulness, the full awareness, and the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind, the zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose. Known they were present. Known they disappeared. And then he understood that there is a higher state to attain. Again because with the abandoning of pleasure and pain and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief Sariputta entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. And the states in the fourth jhana, the equanimity, the neither painful nor pleasant feeling, the mental unconcern due to tranquility, the purity of mindfulness and the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, volition and mind, the zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. Again because with the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, with the disappearance of perception of sensory impact, with non-attention to perception of diversity, aware that space is infinite, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of infinite space. And the states in the base of infinite space, the perception of the base of infinite space, and the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind, the zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. 
known to him those states arose known they were present known they disappeared he understood thus and with the cultivation of that attainment he confirmed that there is a higher attainment or oh, there is this attainment and he uh, again because by completely surmounting the base of infinite space aware that consciousness is infinite Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of infinite consciousness and the states in the base of infinite consciousness the perception of the base of infinite consciousness and the unification of mind the contact feeling perception volition and mind the zeal decision energy mindfulness equanimity and attention these states were defined by him one by one as they occurred known to him those states arose known they were present known they disappeared he understood thus and with the cultivation of that attainment he confirmed that there is that attainment again because with completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness aware that there is nothing Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of nothingness and the states in the base of nothingness the perception of the base of nothingness and the unification of mind the contact feeling perception volition and mind the zeal decision energy mindfulness equanimity and attention these states were defined by him one by one as they occurred known to him those states arose known they were present known they disappeared he understood thus and with the cultivation of that attainment he confirmed that there is again because by completely surmounting the base of nothingness sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of neither perception nor non perception he emerged mindful from that attainment having done so he contemplated the states that had passed ceased and changed thus so indeed these states not having been come into being having been they vanish regarding those states he abided unattracted unrepelled independent detached free dissociated with a mind rid of barriers he understood there is an escape beyond with the cultivation of that attainment he confirmed that there is again because by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non perception sariputta entered upon and abided in the cessation of perception and feeling and his taints were destroyed by his seeing with wisdom he emerged mindful from that attainment having done so he recalled the states that had passed ceased and changed thus so indeed these states not having been come into being having been they vanish regarding those states he abided unattracted unrepelled independent detached free dissociated with the mind rid of barriers he understood there is no escape beyond and with the cultivation of that attainment he confirmed that there is not because rightly speaking were it to be said of any one he has attained mastery of perfection in noble virtue attained mastery and perfection in noble concentration attained mastery and perfection in noble wisdom attained mastery and perfection in noble deliverance it is of sariputta indeed that rightly speaking this should be said because rightly speaking were it to be said of any one he is the son of the blessed one not by blood but because of these attainments 
born of his breast. This is called Orasa Putta, born of his breast, born of his mouth, born of the Dhamma, created by the Dhamma, an heir in the Dhamma, not an heir in the material things. It is of Sariputta indeed that, rightly speaking, this should be said. Because the matchless wheel of the Dhamma set rolling by the Tathagata is kept rolling rightly by Sariputta. That is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Okay, so what do you understand of this? Feels like Greek to you, right? It's a little bit abhidhammic here. It's like profound teachings with more details. That's the nature of this sutta. And please don't expect that you will remember any of this. This will happen to you naturally without you expecting. I gave a simile for this. If you expect things to happen in meditation, uh, it will create anxiety in you. If things go wrong, things go wrong. If things go right, things go right. It's like the little monk who wanted to sit longer, expecting higher jhanas. Um, he, bo he, he took a bunch of uh, incense sticks and started burning them and put them near. And he decided he won't open his eyes until these incense sticks are burnt. But no soon he was slowly opening his eyes to see if they are actually burnt. <laughs> That's the wrong way to meditate. We expect things to happen and we develop some kind of impatience. With that impatience we forget the actual goal. It is to actually have fun in the meditation. So revisit the tadpole example. Tadpole only knows water all his life until he develops tiny legs so he can walk to the ground and experience what it is like to feel the earth free from water. So what you are actually freeing from is the sensual, ple sensual pleasure, aversion, sloth and torpor, restlessness, and doubt. So this is an escape for you that kind of naturally brings um, a state called the first jhana into your awareness. In that first jhana, you heard the word applied and sustained thought. This is called vitakka and vichara. So vitakka simply means thoughts. But the kind of thoughts we cultivate here include thoughts of, this is right, right thoughts, Samma Sankhapa, the second aspect of the Eightfold Path. In it, you cultivate Nekkama Sankhapa, the thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of letting go, Avyapada Sankhapa, thoughts of non-aversion, and Avihinsa Sankhapa, thoughts of non-cruelty. In other words, you six are things, you have loving kindness and you have compassion. You get it? <coughs> so thoughts of letting go is six aring. Recognize, release, relax and return. Thoughts of freedom from ill will means loving kindness. These are good thoughts to have. And thoughts of non-cruelty is compassion compassionately abiding in your minds and you are not afraid of these thoughts. So sustained thoughts means you just sustain your attention in these thoughts. You are just basically aware about their presence. You know you have loving kindness. You, you know you have non-cruelty, that is compassion. You know you are letting go. So you are meditating suddenly some interesting songs, interesting things come up. What do you do? Yes, they are interesting. 
but quickly remind yourself of the precepts that you have taken and the purpose of it, the goal of uh, keeping precepts. You know, there is one verse that says, Silena Sugating Yanti, uh, precepts take you to heaven. Silena Bhoga Sampada, precepts protect your wealth, material wealth, keeping precepts. Protect your wealth. You don't just waste your wealth by gambling or and wasting on um, just anything. And Silena Nibbuting Yanti, precepts take you to the cessation. Tasma, therefore, Silang Visode, purify your precepts. Always, you know, when that song pops up in your head, that's okay. You didn't do anything. Um, it's the nature of the mind. It just, it's used to doing that. So sometimes these Dhamma halls, bathrooms, they have kind of an echo. This echo is uh, some kind of sensation. It reminds you, you of some songs, some, some theatrical performances. And you just need a little bit of mindfulness and awareness to notice it so you don't start singing <laughs> um, all of a sudden and you don't realize that there's this, this, this is going to control the whole day now that you sang a little bit and that keeps coming to you. It's okay when that happens, but there is greater pleasure awaiting you, the, the jhanic pleasure. So jhana, as I said, these are levels of understanding some awareness states and all the past Buddhas when they became enlightened they went through the jhanas so for deep insight to arise jhanas are necessary and here we discuss the four rupa jhanas that are the first second third and fourth jhana they are experienced with the body there is you know permeating your body with the kind of rapture. You, you heard that. And there is that involvement with the body and it's in the Rupa Loka, the realm of Rupa that you experience these jhanas. And then there is Arupa jhana. Arupa is uh, immaterial nature, basically the mental uh, realm infinite space, inf infinite consciousness, nothingness, neither perception nor non-perception. So these were available at the time of the Buddha before even he became the Buddha. But he realized that his goal was not completely accom accomplished, that they didn't know any higher escape. They didn't know um, that once you attain the neither perception nor non-perception, you can stay there forever. I mean, not in the human life, but if you die in that state, it's a state where you just can get, um, get stuck in, in that pleasure and stay forever in that realm, like eons and eons and eons. And those who attained it are still there. And that's not the Buddha came here for, came to this world for. He wanted to reveal the greatest escape from all those constructs. So he discovered the ninth jhana, which is the Nirodha Samapatti. Samapatti means an attainment, Nirodha is a cessation. So your mind gradually reaches a state called neither perception nor non-perception. You perceive things. This is a very this is, this is a state full of equanimity. In that place, you, you don't perceive things and you perceive things. There's actually no things to perceive. There's just so much balance in your mind. It's like a very, very uh, stilled lake. And that too um, ceases. Perceptions and feelings ceases. And your consciousness has nothing to be conscious on. When your consciousness has nothing to be conscious on, it just experiences a kind of cessation. And there, what happens is it's just you don't exist in it. You don't even 
you don't have thoughts in that state thoughts are gone from this you know thoughts are actually left behind uh, from the second jhana state especially uh, when you enter and master the second jhana but by this point when you enter the cessation ex you know when you have the cessation ex you can have many cessations many cessation experiences ultimately you realize uh, that there is no use seeing all these links again and again there is kind of tiredness that arises and you have revulsion toward them uh, there is nibbida there is um, wanting that escape but good wanting wanting the freedom and only after that experience and after emerging from it you know what it what what you experienced then you have more language more words to describe this experience but the problem is our mind tricks us mind it has this nature of uh, um, creating a story um, about these attainments um, and you just believe that you, ex you experience Nibbana. That may not be the case. So in Buddhist path we go through uh, several stages of awakening. The first stage is called stream winning. This is called Sota Apatti. Sota is the stream. Uh, this is like go going against the stream. That the worldlings, usually ordinary people, they go through, go with the current, just with the sensual pleasures and all of that. But you are going against the stream. And when you um, see certain fetters abandoned by you, there are three strong fetters. The view of self, this is called Sakkaya Ditti, and doubt, doubt as a fetter, and uh, Silabhata Paramasa. So Silabhata Paramasa is practices uh, that existed at the time of the Buddha and even now, uh, and with the belief that they will lead you to moksha, liberation. Some practices include standing on one foot, thinking that this will bring you so much suffering and you endure it and that way you end that suffering someday. Actually, the Buddha-to-be was um, also misguided like that. He endured self-mortification um, and he went to the maximum level of it and he realized that if anyone went through this kind of self-mortification, this is the furthest anyone could go. So he decided to come to the middle ground. So he abandoned the Sila Bhata Parama, so these wrong um, practices. And he first introduced right view uh, as part of the Eightfold Path, um, because wrong view you can see how people get misgu misguided by wrong views and they believe it for the rest of their life, unfortunately. So realizing the true nature of the self and realizing the truth of the doubts that you, have, you build confidence in the practice, you don't doubt it, and abandoning those wrong uh, rites and rituals and practices, um, you, you enter the path of the stream winner and by completely abandoning them you become you enter the fruition there is the path and there is also the fruition um, so in that process you see sota panna state or called sota pati fruition it begins with letter S and then the second state is called Sakada Gami that also begins with letter S and the third stage is called Anagami that begins with letter A 
and then the last one is arahat that begins with letter a so all you need is two s passes and two a passes <laughs> and you pass the test <laughs> So Sakadagami, Saka means once, Agami means returning. So when you understand more fetters, that is uh, Kamaraga and Patiga, uh, sensual desire and aversion, um, when you have lessened these in your mind, you only return to this world, the sensual world, once. But when you have completely abandoned sensual desire and aversion, you don't return to the sensual world. You don't see any purpose of returning. So your mind naturally, you don't want these, these uh, states. Um, it's a wisdom informed decision. It's not a decision made with missing something. I will miss sensuality. It's not like that. You just, it's just naturally your mind focuses on escaping the aversion, seeing the danger of aversion, seeing the danger of uh, sensuality. And so that's a non-returner, anagami. That is the word uh, uh, comprised of na agami that na changes to an and an, it, it's, it's finally anagami. This is a great place to be. If your mind is free from sensual desire and uh, uh, aversion, it's a wonderful, wonderful place to be. It's very rare someone attains this level. I'm just saying this. Um, that that is actually to combine it with the the jhana experiences and finally when you become an arahant when you get that you know final attainment um, there are more fetters abandoned by you uh, ruparaga aruparaga mana uddacha avijja so ruparaga is the desire for material realms. Aruparaga is the desire for immaterial states, immaterial realms. Mana is the conceit, conceit that I am this, I have come this far. <laughs> um, and Uddacha is a slight um, restlessness. Um, should, should I jump over to the next level or should I be here? That kind of debate. And avijja is not knowing, ignorance. Not knowing that escaping beyond is the greatest escape. So that is the complete path. And sometimes in some meditation centers in Sri Lanka, they give certificates to these statements. This is not good. <laughs> so, this is not how you get it. So, this one time, this lady went to a retreat and she got a certificate that said she is an anagami, she is a non returner. Mm -hmm. She was quite happy, she went home, and about six years later, she went back. Mm -hmm. And then she got a certificate that says she is a sotapanna, <laughs> she's a lower level. <laughs> this upset her so much. <laughs> How can how come you give me a certificate that says I'm in a lower level now? This upsetting itself tells that she's not actually anywhere <laughs> close to these states. So if anyone gives you a certificate, you don't need that. <laughs> Your understanding of the teachings is enough, and you don't even want to have this kind of spiritual materialism. I am Sotapanna, he is Sakadagami, so I need to compete to get to that level. This is completely unnecessary. This is just proliferations. So, knowing the jhanas um, and practicing according to the jhanas is quite necessary, but attachment to them is not necessary. Knowing the truth here that they are there to support our path, they are there to be pillars of your wisdom.
the kind of wisdom that you craft and build um, in your mind. There are also uh, some um, landmarks pointing you for greater escapes, greater uh, mental relief that you can achieve. But these jhanic levels, uh, they up to the up to the complete cessation, they are temporary. Your defilements are kind of uh, buried uh, with your understanding for some couple of weeks, months, but then they start to come back. This is why the Buddha wanted to find a greater escape. He saw monks who had attained the jhanas those days and they have to keep attaining them but that is not what he wanted. He wanted to find another further escape and that is what he did. Now in the first jhana you noticed uh, piti sukha, happiness and pleasure, joy. So joy and uh, pleasure, born of seclusion, as I mentioned yesterday, seclusion here is actually you can uh, escape to an empty hut where there is seclusion, but mentally you abandon the five hindrances and you abandon the unwholesome states. And, and you choose to purify your mind to experience this greater degree of pleasure, it arises from the kind of seclusion that you give by closing the sensual faculties, the six doors, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, physical sensations, and thinking. Here, uh, with the foundation of precepts, um, you are not indulging so much about basically anything. Um, you are, it's okay to enjoy the sunset as we disc you know, discussed yesterday. Those things are not disturbances to us unless you know you cry and you want the sunset to be yours. It's, it never happens that way. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a story like that. This is a Matta Kundali story, you know, that's a, that's a distraction, so I will not bring that up now. Um, so then in the second jhana, there is uh, Samadhi Jang Piti Sukhang, happiness, um, the joy and happiness born of Samadhi, the stillness of your mind. It arises. So previously it arose from seclusion and now in the second jhana it arises from your stillness. There is further tranquility that you will notice in your, uh, in your mind. And you still can keep loving kindness going toward you. It's actually because you have loving kindness that you give this as a good treat to yourself, a treat that is so rare. And it's achievable. Most people don't read these sutras in Buddhist countries like in Sri Lanka where I come from. So they don't have confidence that these are achievable. But in a place like this where we give a good solid foundation of sila, that is the morality, and we dis discuss the sutras, we just open them up and discuss. And also we closely observe your progress. So, in those circumstances, these things are inevitable and they naturally happen. And, and it is not anyone's doing, it is the natural progress and uh, you're discovering that these are naturally happening, present in you. You only need to maintain a slight effort, uh, right, right effort, samma vayama, to bring up the loving kindness, bring up the compassion, uh, joy and equanimity. These are wholesome states and, and you just maintain um, your awareness focused on inwardly toward 
achieving further stillness. And in the third jhana, there is equanimity starting to get established in your, uh, and you, you will be aware of that equanimity. In the fourth jhana, equanimity and purity of your mindfulness becomes stronger. And in the third jhana state, um, right before the fourth jhana, um, there is freedom from thoughts. You never thought that this is possible, right? Mind always is used to having thoughts. But, you know, your mind, because you have a kind of sincere training, you will see that thoughts are less and less appearing, especially thoughts related to your household life, the things that you have been doing, they disappear. Um, and they will come back when you, you know, place yourself in household life again. But here, <coughs> You are living like a monk, and you, your, your body is kind. Body and mind both are ordained at this time. You are engaging with the Buddha, engaging with those monks who have walked this um, you know, in the past. In 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 the Buddha's time, those monks who have walked this path. It is their minds that you um, engage with. And then you are ready, after the fourth jhana, you are ready to let go of the material realm, and you are experiencing infinite space, infinite consciousness, um, nothingness, neither perception nor non-perception. These are states that are very profound um, experiences. Um, and they are achievable. Um, so in infinite space, um, what the Buddha described with Venerable Sariputta, I wanted to give the you know story of Venerable Sariputta. Well, um, we can visit the infinite um, space first and then go to that. What the Buddha says is that now after the fourth jhana, with the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, with the disappearance of perception of sensory impact, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that spe space is infinite, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of infinite space. So it's also called a base. So um, here, what you have is a state that is an escape. In one way, um, you don't have to focus on joy anymore. You don't have to focus on um, you. You. This is ru uh, the foundation of this is equanimity that you cultivated in the fourth jhana. There is such balance in your mind that you focus on spaciousness that is present, that the mind tends to just be empty. And you notice that space is infinite and you enter upon and abide in that state. By surmounting any desire for you know, visuals to arise, forms to arise. Freedom from form here is kind of engaging with the space. And in the next level, what is engaging with this space here is the consciousness. And you become aware of the consciousness itself. And when you are in that pure state, just basically notice little flickerings barely arising and disappearing, and you are not even labeling any of them. You just, you are in that base, you enter and abide in that, in that base, 
not s no excitement uh, happening they have you know disappeared in the jhana levels already and you look for further escape unless um, in in if you do not look for the further escape you may fall back to the infinite space or from infinite space you fall back to the fourth jhana and then de it deteriorates like that there's also something called mastery of jhanas you can make a determination to stay in the jhana for 10 minutes in the third jhana for 15 minutes and um, so that is another thing that you can do this like this becomes like your playground um, the spiritual play playground so in the experience of nothingness so there is escaping of space escape escaping also of consciousness and you do not focus on space or consciousness here and you focus on nothingness empty uh, just not this not even the space not even looking for you just you're just entering into a space where nothing is happening not even conscious move you know things to things to be you know be you just barely notice the the attainment here um, and you are in very much in equanimity uh, very quiet very very quiet state of mind and you are ready to experience neither perception nor non-perception where you perceive something and you do not perceive anything and there is no act mental activity happening this is when you are ready to experience the cessation cessation of perceptions and feelings when there is nothing to perceive nothing to feel whether it is neutral pleasant or unpleasant nothing to feel how can consciousness be manifested it just ceases this is called nirodha no attachment no rodha rodha is kind of bonding it's uh, it's a way you experience unbinding and you stay there for quite some time or you just emerge from it and you reflect on it oh wow this happened Bhante used to say this is like a blackout experience um, but it's not he said that too um, in these states there is actually no language to describe these levels this is why we find very limited uh, wording here in the discourses of the Buddha and those similes uh, that I read from the Kaya Gata Satisutta is uh, very uh, very much how the Buddha described them um, and he also mentioned um, in Mahasachaka Sutta and other suttas that these states give you tremendous pleasure but there is no need to worry about this pleasure because it's born through meditation born of meditation so I'll tell you the Sariputta story and I will end it there Sariputta and his best friend Moggallana they were sons of wealthy uh, people uh, they, their parents were the leaders of those townships like the mayors and wealthy ones and there was this carnival that came to their town and they were very excited about this carnival and they decided that they will go there every day and enjoy every single performance there was this is called Giragga Samajja a lot of people come together and a lot of uh, dancings, performances, uh, models and all these things. Um, they went on the first day, they watched every event 
they were quite excited and happy and they went on this second day and they went about three four days and they were very tired of seeing all these things it was boring they realized that if such an event such a great event becomes that boring how can we think that the worldly life that we have is um, going to be any exciting they had so much wisdom so they decided to go on separate ways um, looking for true escape true teachings and their followers 500 of their helpers also went and they met one of them, Sariputta. Sariputta means Sari's son. Sari is the Brahmini. She was not a Buddhist, her son. And he met Asaji. But this monk didn't know so much teachings. But he asked for, t you know, Sariputta asked uh, teachings from Asaji. And Asaji said, I don't know much, but I know this much. Ye dhamma hetu pabhava, whatever dhammas are arising, that are arising because of causes. Te sang hetu, their cause, tatagatu aha, the dasgon one, the Buddha teaches. Buddha teaches dependent origination. Te sanchayo nirodo, if there is a cessation of those phenomena that are dependently arising, Evangvadi Mahasamano, the great recluse teach that. Great rec recluse teach the dependent origination. That's all he said. Just by hearing this, Sariputta became a stream winner. And he found his friend and um, and they uh, they together looked for that great recluse, the Buddha. And as they entered, the Buddha was in a big assembly of monks. The Buddha stopped um, the talk he was giving and he saw them approaching from afar and said, these two will be my two great disciples. Right hand disciple became Venerable Sariputta and left hand disciple became Venerable Moggallana. By that point there were many senior monks. but these two were the only qualified ones for that those positions and these two um, the Buddha praised them uh, many times for their wisdom and it is the kind of praise that the Buddha gave that you received today as a teaching they are like um, they became like parents to many monks teaching them Dhamma and uh, the Buddha said, Sariputta is like the one who gives birth to children. And Moggallana is like the one who feeds them. This is like um, they ordain monks and they bring these monks to levels of understanding together. Um, and there are many discourses given by Sariputta. And on occasions when the Buddha was tired, Buddha would say, my back hurt, pittimme agilayati. And he would ask Venerable Sariputta to continue the discourse, and Buddha would go and rest. So it's, it's that kind of position given to Venerable Sariputta. He had that kind of fortunate karma to be in that position, and apparently for many, many eons, he aspired to be the right hand disciple of the Buddha, uh, together with Moggallan, appearing in many births. Um, as friends together. So, um, yeah, that's it for tonight. Um, I think when Delson shows up, uh, you can get more clarifications on uh, jhana points if you are already uh, cult cultivating them. Uh, or in interviews, we can discuss um, this further. But that's it. Do you have any questions?
Ja. Um, there is this sutta is called uh, Metta Sahagata Sutta, accompanied by loving kindness. I actually meant to read it <sighs> during this retreat. Um, it's actually, um, yeah. We will we will bring that up maybe tomorrow. And it's it's real. It's not a longer discourse. It's it's possible we discuss it. And um, in it, um, it says, with the cultivation of loving kindness, you go to a place called Subha Vimokka, liberation into the beautiful. And then you need to connect it with the jhana. And Bhante and us, we had discussions about it. What is you know what is this jhana? What is this beautiful escape? Um, and without commenting on that, I will say with compassion in that sutta, it says compassion takes you all the way into infinite space. So if compassion, the second sublime state, state takes you to infinite uh, space, then loving kindness should take you to the states before, the fourth jhana or the jhanas before. So what is beautiful then could be the jhana. <coughs> um, so loving kindness taking you to these jhanic states and then um, compassion it, ha it has this openness. Compassion infinitely connects with infinite space and joy connects with infinite consciousness and uh, equanimity connects with um, nothingness. Excuse me. So, and um, so that in that discourse, the Buddha says, practice loving kindness with seven factors of awakening as well. So that means you see, equanimity is the fourth sublime state, and equanimity is also an awakening factor, the uh, seventh awakening factor. So you take the sublime state of equanimity and um, cultivate it with the awakening factor of equanimity. That means you do it with the jhanas. We need to really, it's like a maths puzzle here. It's, it's actually like four into seven, four sublime states developed with the seven factors of awakening. And uh, maybe we can discuss that tomorrow. Um, or at some point in the retreat. Yes, his hand went up first. <laughs> Actually, this is very good. This is a very good question. Um, we don't even look for those attainments. Your realization alone tells that you have abandoned those fetters. The view that there there is a permanent self, on the day it gets abandoned, on the day your doubts get eradicated, on the day your wrong rituals and adher adherence to those disappear. Um, you are, whether or not you have been practicing jhana, with the kind of wisdom you know that those states are thin or are completely abandoned by you. So um, you can try to look at the the jhanas uh, and also well, jhanas do help you to discover that there is further escape, there is non s no self, there is no keeping the attainments, keeping the, the jhanic levels permanently with you, that is because nothing stays just because you tell them to stay. And you also develop a kind of wisdom where you, you tell yourself, stop aging, but you realize that it doesn't happen that way. This is kind of um, the wisdom, that's, that's like the morning reflections where I'm subject to um, aging, I'm subject to illness. So you can't stop this by willful thinking. 
This is also an example to learn that um, there is no permanent self. Another way to look at it is by seeing that the physical eye, it gets destroyed um, upon death. If you name the physical eye as yourself, how could it be this, you know, permanent? Uh, if it is associated with the permanent self, how could it be destroyed? So the Buddha do asks these question, you know, questions from us, uh, from us to make make us be aware of the truth of not having a permanent self. He did say that you can call this body a permanent self, but never call this mind a permanent self. Because that is how fast the mind changes, which I think you know by now. So that way, with all ten fetters, you can uh, analyze it yourself and see how jhanas are def definitely helping you to understand um, the attainments and how with loving kindness, absolutely, you see um, your frustrations, aversions, slowly, gradually disappear and you are able to quickly um, notice when aversion arises in you. And you know that you are on the right path. It doesn't have anything to do with attaining a cessation then, or experiencing a cessation. I, I read that somewhere. I, I feel like that's always wrong. But with the jhanas? Well, people attained the stream entry at the time of the Buddha just by listening to Dhamma. Okay. Yeah, that's what I figured when you said Sarah Buddha, just listen to a Dhamma talk and achieve, achieve stream entry. I'm like, that didn't sound like he was saying this is where experience is sufficient. So, okay. There is a story of this um, rich girl. She happened to see a well-built bodied hunter entering her town through the gate and her house was right there. She was on the seventh floor of that house. This was this happened at the time of the Buddha and she had a de strong desire to be his wife. So she disguised herself as a ser <coughs> servant. She just let go of she put so much jewelry, but she disguised herself as a servant, and she went. Um, you know, she went and stayed until the hunter uh, departed the city. Um, she had attained this stream entry already because the Buddha lived in this town, and ha she she had already understood stream entry. Um, and the hunter told her don't come with me, you know, why are you following me? Somehow she quietly followed him and finally he accepted her as his wife. And they had seven children and these children were married to seven uh, women, seven girls. And the Buddha wanted to help all these people, they were hunting. But as a stream winner, um, she lived with the hunter, and the Buddha appeared um, in front, you know, in the forest where they were hunting. Um, and no matter there was there, and the, the, and there was an animal uh, trapped in a snare, and the Buddha released this animal. The hunter, hap, you know, arrived and he was angry. He saw the Buddha there, he didn't recognize, he didn't know the Buddha, he has never seen the Buddha. And he wanted to shoot at the Buddha, but he, f he froze right there because of the Buddha's psychic power. And his sons went looking for him and they all saw that their son, their, their dad is in, you know, in front of this monk, frozen, and they also wanted to shoot the Buddha, but they also froze. And then the mother and all the wives went looking for them and they saw what had happened. As soon as the mother saw the Buddha, she bowed to the Buddha saying, Father, thank you for coming to you know, help us. So the hunter thought, this must be her father. I shouldn't shoot this man. <laughs> and <laughs> he dropped the you know, arrows and all and went and showed respect to 
um, the Buddha, and the Buddha gave teachings, and they all became um, stream winners. How many are there? Fifteen of them. So monks asked what happened to the sixteenth one, the mother. And the Buddha said she had already attained a stream winner state already. Um, so then they asked, why did she support a hunter for killing? How can she be a wife of a hunter? And the Buddha said, it's like this. If you don't have a wound in your hand, you can touch poison. You have no problem. If you have a wound, uh, if you have a wound in your hand, you touch poison, then you you get poison into your body. She had the intention only to support her husband. She never had the intention of killing animals. And that is how the Buddha responded. So the verse is Panimi Che Vanang Nasti Hareya Panina Visang Nabbanang Visaman Veti Nati Papang Akubato. For the person who does not do the evil karma, there is no evil that follows her. Just like you, you can touch poison with a hand that is free from a wound. Um, so the stream winner uh, attainments, uh, they just got it upon listening to the teachings of the Buddha. And the Buddha can see that they had the potential to. So there were millions of people. And you can see in India, uh, there is uh, how many? There is a billion people there. And out of those many, many millions, uh, attained the stream winner state just by listening to the teachings. So it's very important to listen to the Dhamma, listen to the teachings. Okay, any more questions? Yeah. Equanimity is a deeper um, level of um, disappearance of pleasure and pain. Um, so there is um, neutral. Um, there is no reaction to pleasure. There is no re reaction to pain. It's just um, a neutral state. Um, there is adukkama asuka. There is no uh, pain. There is no pleasure there. Um, and you, it gets deepened as you develop uh, a state free from thoughts, free from sensuality, and it just gets uh, very stable, and it further gets purified in the fourth jhana, and that is a very, very subtle balance of your mind. And uh, yeah, that is how it can be explained. Uh, it doesn't. We don't have many words to describe actually these states, but upekka is the Pali word for it. You know, in upekka, there is a quality that chittang yasa nakampati. Your heart is not shaken by eight worldly conditions. Loss, gain, it doesn't bother you. Fame, defame, doesn't bother you. Uh, happiness, pain, it doesn't bother you. Um, insults and praising also doesn't bother you. Your mind is akubba, not shaken. This is because of the equanimity that you develop. Um, so, this is in Mangala Sutta. Chittang yasa nakampati, his mind is not shaken. The Buddha says it's one of the greatest blessings in the world. It is because of the attainment you develop that your mind is not shaken. That you cultivate equanimity and maintain equanimity all the time. That's not the point of it. Upe ka is actually, uh, it's like seeing closely. Upa means closely, ka is like seeing. So you see the truth. You see things arising, you see things vanishing. With that, what is there to enjoy? You ask yourself and you get the answer. Okay. 
Ab absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Seeing closely the three characteristics, uh, impermanence, suffering, and non-self nature. Um, this, is, this happens with Upekka. And, and that way you develop, you get more deeply rooted in uh, Upekka, equanimity. You just see it, yeah. He raised his hand. Um, we have three Upeka. So Jhana for Upeka and Brahma Vihara last one Upeka and the, and the seven factors that are Upeka. Are they the same or different? Oh. Um, they are the same and different because they are actually they are actually, you know, when, when we discuss about jhanas, you know, we talk about jhana upekka, but when we talk about, you know, I think uh, when we talk about seven factors of awakening, um, that I you see it as a factor of awakening, equanimity, so it's a in a jhana, it could be like third jhana upekka, and then it could be the fourth jhana upekka, um, and you develop um, you develop, you purify this upekka to achieve the, the upekka level in the fourth jhana. But when you focus it on, uh, on it as um, an awakening factor, you can base it in uh, the direction of nibbana, not based in the jhanas, and build a, a equanimity to uh, achieve the cessation. That way, the goal of that upekka becomes different, but they they are very much uh, similar also, uh, because um, they, although they are discussed in different contexts, but uh, upekka um, is experienced as a very much of a balanced state. Um, that is how I can describe it. What's the third one you mentioned? Oh yeah, metta, yeah, upeka, there. But that's, that is cultivated, so you can see the progression there. Loving kindness, compassion, um, and then joy, unconditional joy. And then when all these disappear, there is also upeka, equanimity, what is left. So that is then described as a sublime state. And I believe there must be a reason why they are there in all these places, but they all point at one direction, that is toward Nibbana. So I wouldn't... Um, know any better to explain uh, the differences other than they belong in those categories. But we can dwell on it and find out through practice. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm still kind of bothered by the hunter story because she made seven more hunters and like increased the demand for more animals to be killed. No, that was not her intention. But, but if she still did it, it would still happen. No, it didn't happen. If she did not intend, there was no karma produced. It's like you buying meat from the supermarket. You didn't kill that animal. But I'm still like responsible for no, if you the process that Well, doing. you may have killed thousands of insects, ants, walking back and forth today. If I say you, uh, you are responsible for it, this is the wrong way to take the intention. You did not intend to do that. But in Jainism, they went as far as you know, sweeping the road so that they avoid um, killing. But the Buddha did not go that far. And because of this reason, or with all respect to Jainism, Buddhism survived. Jainism is much limited to the culture that it's, it is supported. The Buddha did not introduce those things. If anything was good, he, he introduced it to the Buddhist monks. But most um, teachings, he said, that's not necessary for awakening. What happens with awakening is that um, you become punya papa pahinasa, someone who let go of 
both merits and demerits, evil and good. And also you become kamma khaya, you have eradicated the karma, that you do not produce new karmas. And that happens through your understanding, through your wisdom, and in the in the lenses of an ordinary person, they will say, oh yeah, you contributed to killing, but in your mind, you did not. That is, that is actually not allowed um, in, in Buddhist keeping of precepts. You can say, you know, I don't want to kill, but can you kill this for me? <laughs> that's not that's not keeping precepts. That is breaking precepts. Isn't this what happens when you're vilified and hated and unmerciful? No. I think he's saying you didn't ask the butcher like directly. Yeah. You just bought it at the supermarket. And I, I know where you're coming from. I'm vegan. You, you I can but give a talk I, on all these, um, you know, I think you stuff. Come to a, sorry. Yeah. I think Yeah. Come, you'll, you'll get there probably. Hmm. That's what I mean. Uh, Please don't think about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's not mentioned in the Jhana Suttas. It's just an additional story about you know something else. Yeah. I think what I wanted to say about the same thing. Buddha has tried the ascetic way for so long. He didn't get him anywhere. He came from So for the meat problem, you can look into Amaganda Sutta, Puttamansa Sutta, and Jivaka Sutta. And that's all I will say, because uh, I do not want to feed your minds with uh, thinking about this stuff, um, um, because that's not the goal of our dream practice. We get into thinking, and uh, it's like who came first, chicken or the egg? So <laughs> uh, that's not for us to decide. Um, so we will just let it to rest. I, I think you would call this Buddhist politics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's this side over here, and there's this side, and each side, well, maybe the one that's a little bit more, I'm going to kill that side there. They're wrong. I can actually talk about this subject so much. I have done it, and I really, <laughs> really, really uh, want to let. Yeah, let's. Yeah, let's yeah. All that information comes to my mind right now. Uh, we can talk. Uh, the watch, watch the video on YouTube, Jivaka Sutta 55. It's all there. Yeah. It, there's a lot more to this than yeah. you think. You know. <laughs> Hitler was a vegetarian, Devadatta was a vegetarian, <laughs> and it did, does not mean that they had good intentions all the time. And Buddha refused Devadatta's request to make monks vegetarian, because if you go to Burma, if you go to Thailand, what they give you is perhaps just, an, just a boiled frog. <laughs> And that is what you get for a couple of days, because these villages are poor. And the Buddha saw that. If monks um, 
cannot store food if, if he, they have to depend on lay people and if this is the only food they get they have to accept it and many monks would die otherwise with the starvation um, so he his compassion was like that he did not intend to intend animals to be, be killed um, he wanted animals to be safe the, all the teachings direct at that um, that's all yeah let's stop there <laughs> yes Rahul um, I had a question on the first jhana sutra versus the other one the first jhana sutra that you had read the Buddha seems more like he was giving instructions on how to develop the jhana that's how you led mm -hmm. the first jhana mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's necessary or unnecessary, but it gives you a kind of insight. Therefore, um, we cult, you know, we have the knowledge of it. Mastering of the jhanas is a different thing. Um, so the Buddha has uh, described the way that you can feel that pleasure uh, in the first jhana and and see how you progress through each level. Um, wanting us to experience it. Yeah. If he didn't want us to experience it, um, he wouldn't teach it to us. So um, I, I know some in some traditions they don't, they don't want you to practice the jhanas. But m the more and more I read the sutras, I realize that the Buddha never said that. He, he he of course said never be attached to anything that is you know that is one thing but look for further escape beyond the jhanas you can see that how your these are levels of understanding this naturally happens to you but you don't look for it or you don't stop there saying oh i achieved this level and i know you never mean that but you know some people can see that as the escape and stay there, not go any further. But with the kind of wisdom that you have heard, and now you can see it yourself, how these can be very pleasurable states, but you look, you know, you have heard the Dhamma, that there is further escape. What were you going to say? No, okay. Um, mm-hmm. The one we read today, or can you tell that story? I keep I forgot. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have forgotten that I know completely. <laughs> you were so slow. It took two full weeks. <laughs> full hour yeah, sure. that's true. Yeah. Oh, wow. Just a week? Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> no, actually, yes. N knowing so much doesn't mean that, you know, it's like that professor, you have to empty the cup <laughs> to be free from the knowledge. And experience, experiencing, you know, knowledge is one thing, the ex experience is another. Please remember that. Yeah. Um, I'll ask this question. I, I, I don't experience mastery of anything, right? Maybe never will. But in the jhana experiences, in the jhana descriptions, I feel like sometimes on these retreats I have a, a taste of a higher jhana without necessarily staying there or being able to get back there. Sometimes not in order either hmm. in the way that they're listed here. Is that is is that within the system? Is that accurate? To sort of say that you might get like a taste of or an experience of a phenomenon associated with the jhana without necessarily 
moving through them level by level or yep. being able to stay there? That happens. Sometimes your heart directly escapes even to the cessation actually. It's like you bypass everything else. Um, that's how powerful Dhamma can be. So, yeah. unwrapping plus knowing their true nature. So we have the body and then feelings and perceptions, consciousness and volition. So um, this is called mentality and materiality. So the mentality part is um, what you perceive, what you label, you can perceive color, you can name things. Um, so. Um, Knowing, I think in, in the sutta that we discussed tomorrow, Satipatthana Sutta, we'd come across the five aggregates. Um, what we are supposed, we will know what we are supposed to be doing with that. Um, uh, it's just knowing their existence, but we don't undo the mind. We don't make the mind unmind. Um, it's not possible. We just see the, we just get to the purity of the mind um, mm. because it's corrupted with um, defilements. Uh, that is all we do. Mind is an indriya, a faculty. Um, and we, we just have added so much weight to it. Therefore, um, knowing the Dhamma the mentality aspect of it will help you um, understand the true nature of things happening, the phenomena happening with involvement with the materiality as well. Um, the Buddha said, mind is a forerunner. You know, we read that in the morning. Uh, so things are mind made. You know, in a simple way, y when your mother exists only when you think of her, actually. So, understanding this mind uh, is great insight. And for that, we need meditation. Development of the mind happens with meditation. You can see someone who is in a state of depression. It's like they have a huge grip on something and they need to loosen it like how Bhante Upekananda explained it in the morning just um, it's like you lose your grip and then you slip into the masterpiece that is the wisdom you need to just let go that clinging so mind um, is where all the the mind is the workshop for these practices we do. Um, I think you will answer this question yourself as we uh, learn, as we together discuss and uncover the teachings and practice. Okay. No, I don't think so. Um, I haven't come across similes to the attainments, only to the jhanas. That's why I can combine the two suttas together. You may experience, um, depending on how well your hindrances are you know, treated, those snakes are treated, um, 
they are beautiful they are your teachers and you will notice that you are in a state of ajana and sometimes you easily fall back to hindrances so this is when you know how weak or how strong the first jhana is and the buddha described that that way you know we need to see the danger of falling back to the five hindrances and the drawbacks of the five hindrances and then we escape into the jhana it helps you to stay free from the hindrances and focus on further escape to the second uh, second jhana and this second jhana if it is weak you fall to the first and if the first one is weak you collapse completely to the defilements and this is why we always purify our precepts daily and uh, keep a mind full of energy not too much energy mind full of joy uh, not too much joy just balanced um, factors of awakening they're just working in harmony uh, taking you further and further into deeper levels wherever it is headed You know, forgiveness and metta, these are like uh, the same flavors in different ways. And um, as you know, metta leads to the beautiful, what is, beaut what is called beautiful, subha in, in that sutta. Um, so, yes, it, doing that alone, I wouldn't say it alone helps because uh, the knowledge of the dhamma, also contributes to recognize that this this is the state where you are in right now and it is felt and mm. y you feel um, the escape you feel that the hindrances are not arising and that they are very weakened and your wisdom is stronger um, so forgiveness I would definitely combine it with loving kindness um, and anything else that leads you to the jhana levels. But do not expect jhana to be uh, arising at the end of forgiveness. So at the end, it's just through through escaping the sensual pleasures, uh, escaping aversion, you naturally set realize that you are in the first jhana. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in this, I guess, nuance. So, in this technique, you have the the, the Brahma Viharas, the, the, the loving kindness, compassion. Um, we're using an object like ourselves or somebody else, which is kind of like a thought, may I be happy, well, and then when we think or ex experience a jhana, which is described in terms of feeling, or at least the first one, like, or it feeling, so that part which is feeling and suffusing in the pleasure um, and the stilling of the mind so I find it almost diff impossible to think the thoughts of metta or compassion or those thoughts associated with that practice and then feeling. Because when I'm feeling, there are no thoughts. When I'm thinking, I'm like distracting from the feeling. And yeah. so if I'm just feeling, then I'm very much body-centered or emotions, you know, so... Where is that distinction? You know, thoughts are 
we know that uh, thoughts are not, uh, we can do six sharing in the second jhana. Um, in s you know, si in simple terms, you know, you just have cultivated conditions in your mind in such a way that there is no so much effort need to be done. You just um, you don't even expect um, a stronger like th this is the f the hedonic feelings that we experience. Um, this this is not to be expected and felt in the jhana strongly. What we notice in the description is that there is joy felt and there is <coughs> it's felt across the body, <coughs> everywhere in the body. Um, and joy um, plus happiness, happiness is felt like you are uh, uh, the lotus in the water and you are completely covered with cool water. That is the feeling that you experience. And it, it is a kind of sub sublime feeling. In the third jhana, um, the simile is that it's a spring of uh, springing, so the, which, you know, whichever simile co works with the the which jhana I, I now no, I have to go back um, to be sure. Give me a second. Uh, in that also you see that nothing is being added from anywhere. No water is added to this, sp you know, this pond. There is just coolness felt. So these are, f you know, pleasant feelings felt in that in that jhana level. But I have to make sure that I connect it with the right jhana. Let me see. here your second jhana is connected with the pond the third jhana is the experience where the lotus is under water in simple terms and it's just surrounded you know submerged in cool water so these are feelings felt and uh, Yeah. So you're saying when you're feeling, you're not thinking, and when you're thinking, you're not feeling. So the the idea of the phrases, may I be happy, may I be this and that, is to bring the feeling out. Once you have the feeling, stay with the feeling. No need hmm. to think. Hmm. No need for any phrases. Just simply be, let the feeling be. You achieve the result. Let it be. Yeah that slipped my mind about the statements and the thoughts part. Um, and I focus too much about the, the, f the f yeah, factors and the jhanic uh, sim similes. Thank you, David. Yeah. Yes. It's like that question, you know, it's, uh, they are the somewhat same thing, you know, <laughs> uh, but you escape knowing, it's yeah, you know, uh, with anger, for example, you, you can abandon it, seeing the danger of it, but with the jhanas, you see a higher jhana, so you escape the lower part to get to a greater jhana. Yeah. A yeah. There's further refuge that you see, and you make sure you know you verify that with the experience itself. 
So that is an escape. So you're also escaping your own understanding to go to the next. Escaping your understanding? Yeah, this is about, this is how the sutta words it, that you see higher jhanas, um, that there can be further escape sought after and you achieve it and verify after achieving that it is actually there. Letting go of taking that this is the final escape, this is the final you know, resting, you know, there is further that you can go. Christian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, more suttas coming, so you will hear the word escape more, but you can. <laughs> Yeah. Actually, it's letting go. That's 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 what it is. Yeah. So sim simply letting go. Yeah. <laughs> right. You leave the room to a very comfortable other room. To escape the heat. Yeah. <laughs> it's like. See the danger of the heat. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, his hand is up. I, I wanted to follow up with that, my previous question about the feeling and the... Um, mm -hmm. So there's another number of other suttas which talk about developing, let's say, metta with a quarter of your mind, a half of your mind, three quarters of your mind, your entire mind. Mm. So with respect to feelings, is there kind of like we are drawing this like feelings how, how do we interpret that with respect to feelings you know I have uh, tried that um, it's not s exactly felt that way but it's like gradual progress progress that you come you know brings to fulfillment um, and you now when it is fulfilled you know that you are um, feeling metta, feeling loving kindness, and you are, you know, radiating it. Um, maybe you are half there, or maybe you are just starting. That also we know. Uh, we know that it's not. It has not come to completion yet, but the sutta about you know the metta sahagata sutta has you know that kind of language. And I have tried that, but it's not how I get into metta. So, yeah? I, uh, this quarter is used, uh, it's referring to the six directions. Uh, you're bringing up, hmm. like David said, you mentioned, uh, man, I'm happy. So now the feeling comes up, and you're radiating it. The quarter is right, quarter. Four, That's four a very good, uh, uh, yeah. That's a that's a very good uh, response to this. That um, you can dwell radiating loving kindness to beings in front of you, and you can just infinitely do that. These are uh, these states are called um, upper manas. Uh, these are limitless states. So you can infinitely radiate loving kindness, and you can sense that you have done that and then focus on above and so I think that's a that thank you for that response so it helps yeah so basically what we do is that
Well, we always say sit no less than 30 minutes and uh, uh, and the body tells um, basically if if you if your sitting is good, you want to sit longer um, and that you are following the sublime states good, you, you know there is more you could do uh, and there is only just this tingling sensation that is asking you to stop and you just six are it, let go and you stay longer. Because only by, like Bhantevi always says, only by sitting uh, six hours <laughs> sometimes. Um, you get more insights, um, more patience developed, and uh, there is no way to program it as you know uh, this or that. You know, you, you, incense burning is not a good way to do it. I wouldn't even track, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, there is the need to track. You know, it's it's just unnecessary burden. It just brings up thoughts when you know. See, you can if you can stay, si you know, s stay seated with that thought and until it vanishes. See the imp you know, see the escape from that thought. <laughs> Yeah. After yeah. That, you really need to get up. And okay. Because sometimes your meditation can kind of go down the drain, and pretty much you're just pushing. Time to get up and go walk. I I find it useful. Uh, I really like meditating in the morning, right when I wake up. It really uh, it's like your mind is fresh. There's not much going on. Of course, we're in retreat, so. Good. Okay, let's share mates. <laughs> May suffering ones be suffering free and fear struck fearless be. May grieving shadow grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.